Hello. Welcome back for the second part of Oralinda, the manuscript, Frisian manuscript from the 13th century. If you have not listened to the first part, go find that one. I'll put a link to it in the description as well. Um, and please give the like button a great big hug for me. Here we go. This has Fasta spoken. All the regulations which have existed a century, that is a hundred years, made by the advice of the Ehrenmulder, with the consent of the community, be inscribed upon the walls of the citadel. And when inscribed on the walls of the citadel, they become laws, and it is our duty to respect them all. If by force or necessity any regulations should be imposed upon us at variance with our laws and customs, we must submit. But should we be released, we must always return to our own again. That is Freya's will, and must be that of all her children. Fasta said, Anything that any man commences, whatever it may be, on the day appointed for Freya's worship, shall eternally fail. For time has proved that she was right, and it has become a law that no man shall, except from absolute necessity, keep that day otherwise than as a joyful feast. These are the laws established for the government of the citadels. Whenever a citadel is built, the lamp belonging to it must be lighted at the original lamp in Texlin, and that can only be done by the mother. Every mother shall appoint her own maidens. She may even choose those who are mothers in other towns. The mother of Texlin may appoint her own successor, but should she die without having done so, the election shall take place at a general assembly of the whole nation. The mother of Texlin may have 21 maidens and seven assistants, so that there may always be seven to attend the lamp day and night. She may have the same number of maidens who are mothers in other towns. If a maiden wishes to marry, she must announce it to the mother and immediately resign her office before her passion shall have polluted the light. For the service of the mother and of each of the burnt maidens, there shall be appointed 21 townsmen, seven civilians of mature years, seven warriors of mature years, and seven seamen of mature years. Out of the seven, three shall retire every year and shall not be replaced by members of their own family nearer than the fourth degree. Each may have 300 young townsmen as defenders. For this service, they must study Freya's text and the laws. From the sages, they must learn wisdom. From the warriors, the art of war. Mm -hmm. And from the sea kings, the skill required for distant voyages. Every year, 100 of the defenders shall return to their homes and those that may have been wounded shall remain in the citadels. At the election of the defenders, no burgher or gavetman or other persons of distinction shall vote, but only the people. The mother at Texlin shall have three times seven active messengers mm -hmm. and three times twelve speedy horses. In other citadels, each maiden shall have three messengers and seven horses. Every citadel shall have 50 agriculturalists chosen by the people, but only those may be chosen who are not strong enough to go to war or to go to sea. Every citadel must provide for its own sustenance and must maintain its own defenses and look after its share of the general contributions 
If a man is chosen to fill any office, refuses to serve, he can never become a burgher, nor have any vote. If he is already a burgher, he shall cease to be so. If any man wishes to consult the mother or burked maid, he must apply to the secretary who will take him to the burke master. He will then be examined by a surgeon to see if he is in good health. If he is passed, he shall lay aside his arms and seven warriors shall present him to the mother. If the affair concerns only one district, he must bring forward not less than three witnesses. But if it affects the whole of Friesland, he must have 21 additional witnesses in order to guard against any deceptions. Under all circumstances, the mother must take care that her children, that is, Freya's people, shall remain as temperate as possible. This is her most important duty, and it is the duty of all of us to help her in performing it. If she is called upon to decide any judicial question between the Gravetman and the community, she must inclined, incline towards the side of the community in order to maintain peace, and because it is better that one man should suffer than many. If any one comes to the mother for advice and she is prepared to give it, she must do it immediately. If she does not know what to advise, she must remain waiting seven days, and if she is unable to advise, he must go away without complaining, for it is better to have no advice at all than to have bad advice. If a mother shall have given bad advice out of ill will, she must be killed or driven out of the land, deprived of everything. If her Berg Thurin are accomplices, they are to be treated in a similar manner. If her guilt is doubtful or only suspected, it must be considered and debated, if necessary, for 21 weeks. If half the votes are against her, she must be declared innocent. If two-thirds are against her, she must wait a whole year. If the votes are then the same, she must be considered guilty but may not be put to death. If any of the one-third who have voted for her wish to go away with her, they may depart with all their live and dead stock, and shall not be the less considered, since the majority may be wrong as well as the minority. Universal Law All freeborn men are equal, Wherefore, they must all have equal rights on sea and land, and on all that Radha has given. Every man may seek the wife of his choice, and every woman may bestow her hand on him whom she loves. When a man takes a wife, a house, and yard must be given to him. If there is none, one must be built for him. If he has taken a wife in another village and wishes to remain, they must give him a house there, and likewise the free use of the common. To every man must be given a piece of land behind his house. No man shall have land in front of his house, still less an enclosure, unless he has performed some public service. In such a case it may be given, and the youngest son may inherit it but after him it returns to the community. Every village shall possess a common for the general good, and the chief of the village shall take care that it is kept in good order, so that posterity shall find it uninjured. Every village shall have a marketplace. All the rest of the land shall be for tillage and forest. No one shall fell trees without the consent of the community or without the knowledge of the forester, for the forests are general property and no man can appropriate them. The market charges shall not exceed one twelfth of the value of the goods, either to natives or strangers. The portion taken for the charges shall not be sold before the other goods. All the market receipts must be divided yearly into a hundred parts three days before the jewel day. 
the Gravetman and his council shall take twenty parts, the keeper of the market ten, and his assistants five, the Volksmulder one, the midwife four, the village ten, and the poor and infirm shall have fifty parts. There shall be no usurers in the market. If anyone should come, it will be the duty of the maidens to make it known through the whole land in order that such people may not be chosen for any office because they are hard-hearted. For the sake of money, they would betray everybody. The people, the mother, their nearest relations, and even their own selves. If any man should attempt to sell diseased cattle or damaged goods for sound, the market keeper shall expel him, and the maidens shall proclaim him through the country. In early times, almost all the Fens lived together in their native land, which was called Aldland, and is now submerged. They were thus far away, and we had no wars. When they were driven hitherwards, and appeared as robbers, then arose the necessity of defending ourselves. And we had armies, kings, and wars. For all this, there were established regulations, and out of the regulations came fixed laws. Here follow the laws, which were thus established. Every Frisian must resist the assailants with such weapons as he can procure, invent, and use. When a boy is 12 years old, he must devote one day in seven to learning how to use his weapons. As soon as he is perfect in the use of them, they are to be given to him, and he is to be admitted as a warrior. After serving as a warrior three years, he may become a citizen and may have a vote in the election of the headman. When he has been seven years a voter, he then may have a vote for the chief or king and may be himself elected. Every year he must be re-elected. Except the king, all other officials are re-eligible who act according to Freya's law. No king may be in office more than three years in order that the office may not be permanent. After an interval of seven years, he may be elected again. If the king is killed by the enemy, his nearest relative may be a candidate to su succeed him. If he dies a natural death, or if his period of service has expired, he shall not be succeeded by any blood relation nearer than the fourth degree. Those who fight with arms are not men of counsel, therefore no king must bear arms. His wisdom must be his weapon, and the love of his warriors his shield. These are the rights of the mothers and kings. If war breaks out, the mother sends her messengers to the king, who sends messengers to the gravetmen, who call the citizens to arms. The gravetmen call all the citizens together and decide how many men shall be sent. All the resolutions must immediately be sent to the mother by messengers and witnesses. The mother considers all the resolutions and decides upon them. And with this, the king as well as the people must be satisfied. When in the field, the king consults only his superior officers, but three citizens of the mother must be present without any voice. These citizens must send daily reports to the mother that they may be sure nothing is done contrary to the counsels of Freya. If the king wishes to do anything which his council opposes, he may not persist in it. If an enemy appears unexpectedly, then the king's orders must be obeyed. If the king is not present, the next to him takes command, and so on in succession according to rank. If there is no leader present, one must be chosen. If there is no time to choose, anyone may come forward who feels himself capable of leading. If a king has concert, conquered a dangerous enemy, 
his successors may take his name after their own. The king may, if he wishes, choose an open piece of ground for a house and ground. The ground shall be enclosed and may be so large that there shall be 700 steps to the boundary in all directions from the house. His youngest son may inherit this and that son's youngest son after him. Then it shall return to the community. They, here are the rules established for the security of all Frisians. Whenever new laws are made or new regulations established, they must be for the common good and not for individual advantage. Whenever in time of war, either ships or houses are destroyed, either by the enemy or as a matter of precaution, a general levy shall be assessed on the people to make it good again, so that no one may neglect the general welfare to preserve his own interest. At the conclusion of a war, if any men are so severely wounded as to be unable to work, they shall be maintained at the public expense and shall have the best seats at festivals in order that the young may learn to honor them. If there are windows, widows and orphans, they shall likewise be maintained at the public expense and the sons may inscribe the names of their fathers on their shields for the honor of their families. If any who have been taken prisoners should return, they must be kept separate from the camp because they may have obtained their liberty by making treacherous promises, and thus they may avoid keeping their promises without forfeiting their honor. If any enemies be taken prisoners, they must be sent to the interior of the country that they may learn our free customs. If they are afterwards set free, it must be done with kindness by the maidens in order that we may make them comrades and friends instead of haters and enemies. From Minnow's Writings If anyone should be so wicked as to commit robbery, murder, arson, rape, or any other crime upon a neighboring state and our people wish to inflict punishment, the culprit shall be put to death in the presence of the offended in order that no war may arise and the innocent suffer for the guilty. If the offended will spare his life and forego their revenge, it may be permitted. If the culprit should be a king, gravetman, or other person in authority, we must make good his fault, but he must be punished. If he bears on his shield the honorable name of his forefathers, his kinsmen shall no longer wear it, in order that every man may look after the conduct of his relatives. Laws for the Navigators Navigator is the title of those who make foreign voyages. All Freya's sons have equal rights, and every stalwart youth may offer himself as a navigator to the older man who may not refuse him as long as there is any vacancy. The navigators may choose their own masters. The traders must be chosen and named by the community to which they belong, and the navigators have no voice in their election. If during a voyage it is found that the king is bad or incompetent, another may be put in his place, and on the return home he may make his complaint to the older men. If the fleet returns with profits, the sailors may divide one third among themselves in the following manner. The king twelve portions, the admiral seven, the boatswains each two portions, the captains three, and the rest of the crew each one part. The youngest boys each one third of a portion, the second boys half a portion each, the eldest boys two thirds of a portion each. If any have been disabled, they must be maintained at the public expense and honored in the same way as the soldiers. If any have died on the voyage, their nearest relatives inherit their portion. The widows and orphans must be maintained at the public expense. And if they were killed in a sea fight, their sons may bear the names of their fathers on their shields. 
If a top sailman is lost, his heirs shall receive a whole portion. If he was betrothed, his bride may claim seven portions in order to erect a monument to her bridegroom, and then she must remain a widow all her life. If the community is fitting out a fleet, the purveyors must provide the best provisions for the voyage and for the women and children. If a sailor is worn out and poor and has no house or patrimony, one must be given him. If he does not wish for a house, his friends may take him home, and the community must bear the expense unless his friends decline to receive it. Useful Extracts from the writings left by Mino. Mino was an ancient sea king. He was a seer and a philosopher, and he gave laws to the Cretans. He was born at Lindaord, and after all his wanderings, he had the happiness to die at Lindahem. If our neighbors have a piece of land or water, which it would be advantageous for us to possess, it is proper that we should offer to buy it. If they refuse to sell it, we must let them keep it. This is Freya's text, and it would be unjust to act contrary to it. If any of our neighbors quarrel and fight about any matter except land, and they request us to arbitrate, our best course will be to decline. But if they insist upon it, it must be done honorably and justly. If anyone comes and says, I am at war, you must help me. Or another comes and says, my son is an infant and an incompetent, and I am old, so I wish you to be his guardian and to take charge of my property until he is of age. It is proper to refuse in order that we may not come into disputes about matters foreign to our free customs. Whenever a foreign trader comes to the open markets at Waringen or Almaland, if he cheats, he must immediately be fined, and it must be published by the maidens throughout the whole country. If he should come back, no one must deal with him. He must return as he came. Whenever traders are chosen to go to trading stations or to sail with the fleets, they must be well known and of good reputation with the maidens. If, however, a bad man should by chance be chosen and should try to cheat, the others are bound to remove him. If he should have committed a cheat, it must be made good and the culprit must be banished from the land in order that our name may be everywhere held in honor. If we should be ill-treated in a foreign market, whether distant or near, we must immediately attack them. For though we desire to be at peace, we must not let our neighbors underrate us or think that we are afraid. In my youth, I often grumbled at the strictness of the laws, but afterwards I learned to thank Freya for her texts and our forefathers for the laws which they established upon it. Waralda or Alvedar has given me many years, and I have tra traveled over many lands and seas, and after all that I have seen, I am convinced that we alone are chosen by Alvater to have laws. Lida's people can neither make laws nor obey them. They are too stupid and uncivilized. Many are like Finda. They are clever enough, but they are too rapacious, haughty, false, immoral, and bloodthirsty. The toad blows himself out, but he can only crawl. The frog cries work, work but he can do nothing but hop and make himself ridiculous. The raven cries, spare, spare, but he steals and wastes everything that he gets into his beak. Fenda's people are just like these. They say a great deal about making good laws and everyone wishes to make regulations against misconduct, but does not wish to submit to them himself. Whoever is the most crafty crows over the others and tries to make them submit to him till another comes who drives him off his perch. The word Eva is too scarce, sacred for common use. 
therefore men have learned to say even. Eva means the sentiment which is implanted in the breast of every man in order that he may know what is right and what is wrong, and by which he is able to judge his own deeds and those of others. That is, if he has been well and properly brought up. Eva has also another meaning, that is tranquil, smooth, like water that is not stirred by a breath of wind. If the water is disturbed, it becomes troubled, uneven, but it always has a tendency to return its tranquil condition. That is its nature, just as the inclination towards justice and freedom in exists in Freya's children. We derive this disposition from the spirit of our father, Ralda, which speaks strongly in Freya's children and will eternally remain so. Eternity is another symbol of Ralda, who remains always just and unchangeable. <coughs> Eternal and unalterable are the signs, wisdom, and rectitude, which must be sought after by all pious people and must be possessed by all judges. If therefore it is desired to make laws and regulations which shall be permanent, they must be equal for all men. The judges must pronounce their decisions according to these laws. If any crime is committed respecting which no law has been made, the general assembly of the people shall be called, where judgment shall be pronounced in accordance with the inspiration of Ralda's spirit. If we act thus, our judgment will never fail to be right. If instead of doing right, men will commit wrong, there will arise quarrels and differences among people and states. Thence arise civil wars, and everything is thrown into confusion and destroyed. And, O oh, foolish people, while you are injuring each other, the spiteful Fenda's people, with their false priests, come and attack your ports, ravish your daughters, corrupt your morals, and at last throw the bonds of slavery over every free man's neck. And we will stop there for this recording. Looks like there's probably going to be four parts to this. Give me a like, uh, share the channel, make me a comment, tell me how you think, um, what you think, and it was good to see you again. I hope that you come back soon. Thank you. Have a good night.